Namaste and greetings. I, Zubia Moin, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav, Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all at IMPRI, hashtag web policy talk. Today, we are gathered for a special talk on the topic, the state of discrimination, sub-national comparison of legal barriers to women's right to choose work in India by Bhuvana Anand. This deliberation is a part of the State of Gender Equality hashtag Gender Gap Series organized by the IMPRI Gender Impact Studies Center. As the chair for the session, we have Professor Vibhuti Patel, visiting distinguished professor at IMPRI and GISC, former professor, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. We welcome you, ma'am. With permission of chair, I would like to introduce the gathering. Yeah, please, Zubia, go ahead and introduce the panelists. Thank you, ma'am. We are elated to welcome our distinguished speaker, Bhuvana Anand, co-founder and director, Triad. Bhuvana Anand has 16 plus years of experience in public policy research and has worked extensively alongside government and civil society partners on creating and enabling an environment for enterprises, regulatory simplification, and reforming welfare programs. She's the lead author of her foundation, Triasis debut publication, The State of Discrimination Report. She's the former director, research at the Center for Civil Society, one of India's leading think tanks. She led the thinking and execution of multiple high visibility research publications, including 100 laws for repeal, doing business in Delhi, anatomy of K-12 governance, playbook for reforming Indian agriculture, and regulation for new realities. She has published several opinion articles on domestic policy in leading print papers. She is also a faculty at CCS Academy, where she delivers lectures and training on new public management and fundamentals of public policy. In her roles with the British government's Department for International Development and MIT's Poverty Action Lab, she has worked with the state governments of Odisha, Madhya Pradesh, and Punjab. Bhuvana is a member of the Gain Ease of Doing Business Task Force that works to transform the operating environment for small enterprises in select states. She also advises and collaborates with Avanti RegTech, the ASRA, and Pune International Center on Policy and Regulatory Analysis. Prior to returning to India in 2010, Bhuvana worked in development consulting with Deloitte Emerging Market Group, now Carto Emerging Markets, and the United Nations. She spent several years in Afghanistan and Sudan working on institution, institution building. Bhuvana graduated graduated with a bachelor's in economics from St. Xavier's in Bombay and a master's from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, where she specialized in development economics. We welcome you, ma'am. We are also joined by esteemed discussants. First, we'd like to welcome Dr. Nisha Sharma, Assistant Professor of Economics, Ashoka University, Dr. Yamini Atvilas, Technical Head, Head Strategy and Research at Circle.in, former India Lead for Gender Equality, India Country Office, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. A very warm welcome to all of you. Now, I invite our chair, Professor Vibhuti Patel, to initiate the deliberation with her opening remarks, invite our esteemed speaker, and to proceed further. We look forward to learning from the esteemed gathering. Thank you. So, good morning, friends. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Arjun Kumar, uh, Dr. Simi Mehta, and IMPRI team for providing us this very important platform for discussion on an extremely important dimension of a state of discrimination, a subnational comparison of legal barriers to women's rights to choose 
work in India. Most of the studies in gender uh, issues are basically, they focus on a macro reality, but subnational comparison is a very important concern. And I think when, I, uh, first of all, I also need to uh, express my heartfelt thanks to Ms. Prisha Saxena, who shared this report by email. And after reading it, I felt that it is very important to discuss it in a broader platform. Uh, because it has, it is a data driven, and we can also come up with so many legal reforms as a result uh, if the policymakers take it seriously. I greet uh, Ms. Bhuvana Anand, today's main speaker, uh, and the discussants, Dr. Yamini Atmavilas and Dr. Anisha Sharma. Uh, we know that Indian women's subordination in different sectors of economy has two dimensions. One is a lateral subordination where women dominated sectors and occupations have lower status and are attributed lower values that male dominated sectors uh, than the male dominated sectors and occupations. And subordination in vertical dimension where women as a group are to be found at a lower level in the hierarchies than men. So dynamics of discrimination against women in workforce are informed by systems and structures of patriarchy and male domination in practice and legitimized by the rules, both written as well as unwritten rules uh, at time uh, under garb of safety or outright denial without any explanation. Women are overrepresented in informal sector worldwide where law of jungle prevails. Only 8% of women in the workforce in our country are covered by quote and quote protective legislations about which we are going to have a very detailed discussion today. And women are not allowed opportunity for skill training and become first targets of retrenchment when mechanization, automation, rationalization takes place. All this we have discussed over the last 40 years in, after the Towards Equality Report was presented in the Parliament of India. At that time, the gender stereotypes come handy to ease out women employees and also to close doors for a newer opportunities for women. These verses, uh, which have been used by fin gender training for uh, by the women's rights movement for over four decades, they bring out very succinctly how these gender norms they perpetuate the male domination and female subordination in the economy. Female, uh, a family picture in his desk. Ah a solid, responsible family man. Family picture is on her desk. Mm, her family will come before her career. His desk is cluttered. He's obviously a hard worker and a busy man. Her desk is cluttered. She's obviously a disorganized scatterbrain. He's talking with his co-workers. He must be discussing the latest deal. She's talking with her co-workers. She must be gossiping. He's not at his desk. He must be a meet at a meeting. Uh, she is not at her desk. She must be in the ladies' room. He is having lunch with the boss. He is on his way up. She is having lunch with the boss. They must be having an affair. The boss criticized him. He will improve his performance. Boss criticized her. She will be very upset. He got an unfair deal. Did he get angry? She got an unfair deal. Did she cry? He is getting married. He'll get more settled. She's getting married. She'll get pregnant and leave. He's having a baby. He will need a raise. She's having a baby. She'll cost the company money in maternity benefits. He's going on a business trip. It is good for his career. She's going on a business trip. What does her husband say? He's leaving for, for a better job. He knows how to reorganize good opportunity. She is leaving for a better job. Women are not dependable. Now, this attitude are not only in the society, or these are not the personal beliefs. These attitudes impact our labor policies, programs, and legislations. The Indian state has consider, is considered to be proactive in labor jurisprudence. Over the last 150 years, India has enacted 48 central legislations and over 200 state-specific legal safeguards for workers. They have clearly defined women's status, rules of inclusion and exclusion in the employment market. Still, India has one of the lowest work participation rate of women, though the number like the, of the degree holders have increased exponentially and you, we are very, very proud of it. But why these degrees don't translate into the employment and career, that is a major challenge. So are the legal provisions backed by Constitution of India enabling or disabling for women? The report prepared by Bhuvna Anand and Sarvani Pulkar 
uh, of TRIAS, T-R-A-Y-A-S, uh, Delhi uh, tries to answer most of mind-boggling question, i.e., uh, what is the state of discrimination against women job seekers in India? This report presents a comparison of 23 states on extent of sex-based legal discrimination with meticulous examination of central legislation, state-specific laws, and the court cases by examining four parameters of night work, hazardous work, arduous work, and job deemed to be morally inappropriate. Now, I and we also have an equally esteemed uh, discussants. Uh, so I think, first of all, I would like to ask Ms. Bhuvna Anand to share the highlights of the report. Over to Ms. Bhuvna Anand. Thank you so much, Professor Patel. Professor Patel, I must say, I feel like I've been punched in the gut when you were listing out all of the ways in which, uh, you know, we, we tend to use stereotypes against women. Thank you for that. I feel a little bit disoriented after hearing that. Um, I think this the conversation that I want to have today, uh, or at least want to present uh, some of our findings on, uh, focus on one aspect of what, uh, you know, sort of the, the landscape that Professor Patel laid out. And that is the role of the state in excluding women from uh, the workforce, uh, where they play an active role in making decisions saying, no entry laga hai. And that's the examination that we've taken. So we've been narrow, we've been specific, We've been very particular, understanding fully well that gender discrimination, uh, in getting women into the workforce is a large multi-pronged effort. Several things are going wrong sort of almost simultaneously. And uh, our effort is to chip away at one particular part of what we, one particular uh, part of the problem that we've been able to identify. Uh, I'd like to share my screen. Um, Great. It's uh, well, yes. Please? Yeah, it's, it's working well. Yes, thank you. Um, so from beginning January 2021, uh, my colleagues at Trias and I uh, started to think about, you know, so we just founded Trias in January. Uh, so we're very, very young. Uh, and as a woman co-founded uh, organization, we kept thinking, you know, we, we do want to work on gender, uh, but Trias' specialty and our focus is regulation and law. And so we would have to find, uh, you know, sort of the, the merry match between these two areas. But we had been working on labor regulations for a while before that, and we had sort of noticed a few instances, which of course is being, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, women in the field were also grating on us. Um, we'd noticed that laws would offhand say things about um, uh, oh, women need to be protected or women need to be kept out or we will not allow women to do X or Y. But we hadn't realized quite the extent of the pattern. So we thought, why don't we spend some time and see one uh, discover the whole extent of the problem if we can. And second, look at the, uh, uh, the patterns that we can identify. And based on those patterns, are there insights that we can uh, share with the world? Uh, this was sort of the effort that we started. It took us about a year, a year and a half to be able to come up with the state of discrimination report. And, I, and that part of it is important just from, uh, uh, for all of us interested in public policy reform. Uh, so there's not just the gender story, that's the broader governance and regulation story that I think is also important. I don't need to belabor the state of Indian working women, right? Uh, they're typically underrepresented, uh, underpaid and overlooked. Uh, the formal economy, uh, Professor Patel, you did allude to that. We have a labor force participation crisis for women. Uh, it's either, uh, you know, sort of not, well, it should have been much higher than it is uh, for men. Men are about three times as much as women. Um, and it seems to be declining or dropping or, you know, sort of uh, women aren't staying in the job force uh, for long periods of time. This, all of this, despite the fact that we know that uh, education levels among women are rising, fertility levels are falling. So what's going on uh, uh, in India in, uh, on this parameter? Uh, women also typically are earning low wages and highly insecure jobs. We know that lots of women uh, happen to be employed uh, in the informal sector or have an informal status either in manufacturing or in services. Uh, or they're of course uh, engaged in uh, low income and low productivity work, uh, dead end jobs uh, oftentimes, right? There is also a managerial rise up problem uh, 
research does tell us that women are better supervisors, uh, tend to be better workers, they're more conscientious, more uh, diligent, uh, but they're not rising up the ranks just uh, in, in terms of proportions. So what's going on overall? Uh, some of this is, a, a, you know, sort of a worldwide phenomenon, but some of this is peculiar to India, and uh, certainly India has not managed to correct this over uh, over a long span of time. What's women keeping women from the workforce? Uh, several folks have been attempting to answer this question or unpack the complexity of this question. Uh, we've identified several supply side factors, right? Marriage, household income, the fact that families are perhaps getting more prosperous or don't need both partners to, uh, to earn, childcare responsibilities, general family care responsibilities. Uh, Professor Patel and I were talking the other day and she pointed out that care of the elderly as our uh, uh, sort of demographic uh, um, uh, break changes. Um, but one particular element that we've been able to you know, sort of put on the table is the laws of the land. Um, and uh, it, the dismal um, female labor force participation rate, some will argue that it may be more likely for low and declining demand for uh, female workers. So what's going on there and uh, uh, how might we help address that challenge? The state of the uh, discrimination report is focused on one element of uh, demand side factors. There are uh, employer behaviors, employer stereotypes. There is uh, the costs potentially that are coming up from protective legislation. There is uh, potentially a you know, sort of misunderstanding or an unaware lack of awareness about the value addition that women provide uh, uh, in different roles and so on and so forth. And this good old culture and uh, 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 tradition, right? That also plays a role. Um, in the state of the discrimination report, we unpack about 48 laws uh, across the country. Uh, given that this is a pan-state index, we focus on rules meaning that the places where states have the ability to either change or, of course, uh, 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 to institute discriminatory provisions. And, of course, notifications and orders simply because uh, subordinate legislation does play a, um, a role in uh, how the government exercises its, its functions. We try to compare 23 states, why not 28? Because of data, you know, in some par parameters, we weren't able to find data, uh, particularly for Northeastern states. Uh, and so we had to ultimately, in order to be able to get a score and a rank and so on, uh, 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 keep some states out. Whatever data is available, we have tried to put that out as public goods uh, on our website. All the data sets are available for uh, download, dissemination, use, uh, further research, uh, etc. So we've got, uh, there's a full data pack that is available. One of the things that uh, I think that was at the back of our mind when we started this work uh, is that it, keeping women out of the economy is, you know, sort of principally abhorrent, right? It, it, it annoys, I'm sure it annoys all of us uh, to be told what we can and not do, to have that decision made for us ex ante, to have that autonomy taken away from us. So there's a principle, uh, there's a principles issue there. It's also practically expensive. Um, if, why would you keep, why would 50% of your workforce, if, if it's not in the work, 50% of your uh, demographics are not in the workforce, you have a problem there, right? Um, plus, we know that removing restrictions worldwide has had positive outcomes. Uh, there are several research papers that allude to different elements of change, right? Whether it is restrictions on uh, uh, working at night, whether it is restrictions on uh, geography, whether it is restrictions on type of industry, so on and so forth. And one hypothesis that, uh, uh, that we do have is that women are key to India's aspirational growth agenda. That is an instrumentalist view, I recognize that. That being said, that if there are going to be massive gains uh, uh, in, from growth, it will come as we increase women's participation, male uh, labor force participation. Even though it's not a peak, it's still fairly uh, you know, sort of high. The, the, the gap comes in with, with women. Um, a McKinsey report sort of suggests that uh, approximately 700 billion to the economy by 2025 were we to drastically increase women's labor force participation. All of this feels like a good set of reasons to focus on this problem, and particularly for us from the lens of exclusion as a challenge. Uh, what does the state of discrimination attempt to do and what? how did we go about it? I've spent a little bit of time uh, on the measurement uh, approach that we took uh, to highlight a couple of things. One is over the last few years, 
competitive federalism has become, you know, sort of quite a bit of a theme uh, in governments and in, in our uh, policy lens, right? Um, and therefore, thinking of states as autonomous actors or as actors who can who certainly have a role, a big role to play uh, in determining the fates of individuals in this country. I think that has gotten a lot of salience. So the, it was important for us at least to think about the pan-state story and the competitive federalism story. The second part of the measurement, uh, the reason why I spend a little bit of time on this, is just the complexity uh, that if you were to try and understand uh, the role of law and regulation in India, just to demonstrate how impossibly hard it is and what kind of uh, effort goes into that. And the third is thinking about how do you make something distillable and usable by, uh, uh, you know, sort of, um, by creating, you know, sort of, yeah, some kind of buzz around it or some kind of numbers that are valuable and aspirational for, uh, for different uh, state actors. So how did we measure the state of discrimination? The first, as I mentioned to you, first it was just an idea that came to us simply because we had sort of observed uh, stray uh, elements of legally sanctioned sex discrimination uh, in, uh, in, in particularly in labor laws. Um, and so we said we need to systematically uh, analyze a series of labor laws. So we began with labor, um, but we also looked at several other areas. So, for example, we had noticed that excise and public entertainment related laws, that public order related laws uh, tended to, you know, sort of have something to say about keeping women in or uh, out. Uh, we also noticed, um, you know, sort of just by reading in uh, through news articles, if we will, stray references to uh, laws that had that, that seemed off. So, for example, one of the ones that has stuck in my mind for a long time is uh, I think in Andhra Pradesh, it's the Mulki uh, Dancer uh, Act, which was specific to, uh, sorry, non-Mulki Dancer Act, so which basically meant if you were an immigrant uh, woman dancer, right? So those kinds of things that sort of uh, uh, grated at me, but also things that uh, all of the team had been able to find just by reading a little bit here and there. So we wanted to uh, ask a set of questions. So first we said, well, does systematic legally sanctioned sex discrimination exist? Uh, if so, we would have to identify what are the laws that are applicable across states. So both the things that states peculiarly do, but that all states seem to do. Second is what can the literature tell us about the typology of restrictions? The World Bank in particular has played a role in, you know, sort of bringing uh, uh, or identifying the method to madness across the world in the Women, Business and Law series. So there was an inspiration there that, uh, that uh, existed. And they had given us some ideas on how do you think about uh, a subnational measurement in India. Um, so we started to ask the question, can women do X? And our can is not about ability, it is about legal sanction. So is, are they allowed to do X? Then we also noticed that it's not just about a yes and no binary. It's a question of how much discrimination exists, meaning what types of tools does the state employ in order to be uh, in order to discriminate, or uh, to what extent does it uh, uh, employ these tools? Right? Uh, is it to everybody uh, bar any discretion? Is it to some basis discretion? What is the nature of that discretion? And then, of course, how per pervasive other uh, restrictions as I just mentioned? And then, ultimately, thinking about how to create a composite index by converting scores into ratings. And here it took us a long time to figure out what the right way was. We kept on going after complexity and being as uh, uh, you know, sort of robust as was possible. But then we also realized that uh, there is, our stance is largely argumentative. And because it is argumentative, in some sense, it will be arbitrary. Uh, and so we take the, the simplest path of that arbitrariness and try to present our justification for why we have ranked or uh, rated states in X or Y. So the first uh, sort of element was to identify what the patterns in laws, right? And to identify uh, in what ways or uh, on what areas the state discriminates. The first simple thing was for us to uh, 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 you know, list out all the can women do and I think we came up with about 11 such across that were pan state. Uh, the first of these were, can women work at night in factories? Can they work in shops and establishments at night in factories? Can they work in plantations? Can contract female contract workers work? Uh, can female migrant workers work? And so on. Because every one of these has an attached law to it. 
this, uh, as we started to unpack, we realized that working at night uh, was a large element of the kinds of restrictions that the state uh, um, that the state had put in place. Um, it's just as background, uh, the uh, working at night restrictions in some ways emerged from the ILO conventions uh, three and four, which is around the uh, uh, 1920s. Um, but of course, something interesting happened is that many places in the world did withdraw. India stuck with it for much longer, and then there was a uh, uh, there was uh, it was hard to go for, for whatever reason hadn't been considered to rule it back. The next uh, you know sort of element of the index and the patterns that we were able to establish is this question of working in hazardous jobs, and we define hazardous in you know sort of the way the government defines hazardous, which is typically processes that have been deemed hazardous. Many many labor laws expressly use this phrase and term, uh, and they say you know either parts of the factor, parts of the uh, manufacturing process areas of a factory where you can or not work, areas of an establishment where you can or not work, particular activities that you can or not take. And these have been uh, classified typically as being as, uh, as being hazardous. Some of the history of this classification comes from uh, the 1880s and the 1890s, uh, where the first labor commissions in India came up where they had identified the need uh, you know, that there was a problem in factories with uh, uh, unsafe working conditions for workers. But of course, when there was an additional distinction that was drawn in the midst of, uh, of this larger uh, uh, protective quest uh, of ring fencing women. The third of the parameters that we were able to identify was the question of working in jobs deemed arduous. Uh, and largely here it is about lifting weights. Uh, the ability to be able to engage in uh, any kind of activities that involve heavy objects, uh, the lifting, the moving, the, uh, the reorganization of heavy objects, typically on, a, on the factory floor. Uh, but this is one, one element. Of course, here we were only able to identify one particular question, which is that can women work in tasks that require them to lift heavy objects? And again, the frame of reference is meant to say in the same way. So this is not to make a claim that women uh, across the board on average can lift the same level of weights as men can. That's not the assertion. It's simply to ask what are the restrictions on their ability to do so. And the last is, a, you know, I think the trickiest and most interesting uh, category, which is of uh, working in jobs deemed morally inappropriate. And of course, this is a very wide net and we tried to, uh, uh, you know, sort of bring some method to madness here. Um, across the board, there are several laws across states that do make a moral judgment on uh, certain occupations, uh, and particularly these happen to be uh, gender affiliated occupations. Typically, dancing, entertainment, um, you know, sort of, uh, of course, sex work is one that we're all well familiar with, um, but we were able to find one pattern that existed across states, which is in the excise laws of states, uh, which deal with the serving and the sale of liquor, consumable alcohol. Uh, this is true in, and particularly because our excise laws are uh, as uh, over-engineered as they are. Um, this happens to, uh, this happens in two ways: in the sale or the uh, in the sale or the uh, the service of uh, country liquor or tardi, the way we I think more commonly know it. Uh, but also in foreign liquor, the way we see. Now, this is not to make a judgment on whether this is moral or immoral or any of that. It's simply to highlight that systematically you are making, uh, you are ring fencing women with a, a certain set of interests in mind. Then we moved on to identify the pervasiveness, the extent of the discrimination, right? And we identified patterns in the regulatory stance used to process. So we ask the question, if you ask the question, can women, women do X? Uh, the answer can be yes, no. But it turns out we find that it is absolutely nothing doing. It is yes, 
but you have to come to us for permission every time you want to do it. And the come to us for permission is typically for an employer, but sometimes for uh, women as well. Uh, yes, subject to conditions is that roughly speaking, here are the conditions you need to abide by. And we may give you a, a sectoral or an industry exemption uh, if, you claim, if you claim to be able to abide by these uh, conditions. And lastly, of course, absolutely yes. Right. So that's the four uh, patterns that we discovered in the regulatory stance used across states. Now, of course, it, nothing is that simple in India, right? Um, and the problem is that it's, it's, a, it's also a question of, yes, across the board, yes, in some establishments, yes, in most establishments, how do you think about that question? So we simply drew out a spectrum. And we said, if we were to uh, create a spectrum from zero, meaning absolute prohibition, to 100, which is complete uh, freedom, what are the ways in which we might be, what are the combinations and permutations that we might be able to find? We had noticed another permit, uh, uh, another pattern in the, in the laws and rules, which is that typically uh, it was a, a two, no more than two uh, sort of stances that they took. So for example, for most establishments, the approach would be one way. For some establishments, it might be a slightly different way. So it wasn't that much more complicated than that uh, in the writing of the rules. So we took advantage of that and created these binary combinations. Sorry, not binary, it was uh, 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 the, the two parameter combinations and we uh, listed all of them out. Yes, there is some judgment that we have applied. So for example, why is subject to permission better, uh, less uh, uh, or subject, subject to conditions better than subject to permissions? Our idea was simply that Permission is in every single enterprise interface that, that is required, which means that the amount of discretion and power in the hands of the executive is much larger than in the case of conditions. So there was that was the logic that we applied. There are different ways to look at this. We are fairly confident that the, the simple approach uh, adds value in our understanding of regulation as well. Um, I've give, listed some examples on the screen. So for example, uh, if Andhra Pradesh says that no woman shall be required or allowed to work in a factory except you know, between the hours of 6 a.m. and 7 p.m. Uh, that would be an absolute no. And there are no provisos and there are no uh, exceptions that are drawn out. In Uttar Pradesh, um, it says 6 a.m. to 7 p.m., but unless the state government authorizes uh, uh, the employment between the hours, right? And therefore, it comes somewhere uh, in the permissions range, if you will. In Tamil Nadu, uh, they have listed conditions on uh, um, certain parameters and therefore they get a score of 60, if you will, because it, the answer is yes, subject to conditions. And somewhere in between, we've tried to identify the, uh, the, the, the stance as far as all establishments, the stance as far as most establishments, and the stance as far as uh, some establishments. This is not de facto. This does not uh, translate into pervasiveness on the ground. This is uh, pervasiveness in law. So I want to make that uh, you know, sort of slight distinction. Um, we also, to be able to contextualize all that we were understanding, right? we also did a uh, systematic case law analysis. Uh, we looked very specifically, there are a whole bunch of cases on gender discrimination, but we were looking at very specific uh, discrimination, which is uh, challenges uh, in courts uh, to government or state uh, legally sanctioned sex discrimination. Most of this was concerning the four parameters. There were some cases which were about public sector employment, uh, and those were instructive uh, for us to be able to understand the larger context in which the state thinks about um, uh, these kinds of regulations and rules, right? Um, some of the cases we've listed them uh, on the screen, uh, and these are, you know, sort of fairly, uh, uh, seminal cases or judgments in the in the discourse and time and time again what you're uh, finding really is women have uh, this is not new this battle isn't you know Thais hasn't picked this up out of nowhere for the last 50 60 years women have been knocking on the doors of court saying hey not okay hey I don't think this is right hey you're preventing me from uh, doing so and I think uh, our constitution does not allow the state to be uh, to take the stance of uh, uh, discriminating against me on the basis of my sex. So uh, it's not a new effort. Uh, and in some ways, we're all always standing on the shoulders of giants, right? So it's all of these women working in factories across the country who have knocked 
uh, at lower courts, high courts, and then for, chased it up all the way to Supreme Courts for us to see uh, many changes and many uh, instructions at the very least from courts saying, uh, how can you think about this? Or dilutions from the court saying, uh, you need to, to do this perhaps in a less uh, restrictive manner. So what are the findings and insights from the state of discrimination report? How free are India's uh, female job seekers? So across the board, uh, there are some states that are doing better than others, as I imagine is always the case. The challenge though is the frame of reference. No state is a remarkable example of freedom for female job seekers, which I think uh, should hit us all in the gut, right? But of the states and the ways that we've measured them, uh, your usual suspects, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Goa, uh, do stand out compared to other states. Uh, Karnataka, uh, Himachal, uh, who sort of follow closely. Um, that being said, do keep in mind that the, it, this is a relative uh, ranking um, and not a statement of how deeply free India's women could be in, uh, in law. Employment at night is the most heavily legislated subject. Uh, the Factories Act 1948 consists of most, contains the most restrictions uh, across all the big laws that we've studied. Um, the least freedom and the least variation in some sense is on the employment of women in job steeled arduous. That is in the lifting and uh, tasks that involve objects with heavy weights. The fewest restrictions are in uh, women uh, in processes deemed uh, or jobs deemed hazardous in shops and establishments. But just as a, uh, you know, sort of, uh, just to, to, to clarify, typical shops and establishments don't really have hazardous conditions, right? So uh, it's not a, a, a large win. And very few states give complete freedom on any indicator. There are one or two uh, straight examples of this, but uh, it, it, it's not a, uh, we're not seeing a state where uh, many states give you complete freedom on one or the other indicator. It's very, very rare. And in fact, in, on most indicators, you see a clustering around the middle or uh, towards closer towards prohibition. What is the rough state performance on working at night? So whether it is in factories, whether it is in shops and establishments on plantations as migrant workers or as uh, contract workers, the most free states in India are Kerala, Uttar Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, and Karnataka. The least free states are Meghalaya, Telangana, and Odisha. Uh, the, on hazardous, which I think from the point of view of uh, how do you get women to rise up the ranks? How do you get women fully integrated in manufacturing? Or particularly if you aspire towards becoming an export-led manufacturing country, how do you get women involved in this? Uh, this is something for us to pay very close attention to. Uh, the most free states on jobs deemed hazardous are um, Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, uh, sister uh, states. The least free, interestingly, are Tamil Nadu, Tripura, and Madhya Pradesh. Tamil Nadu was a surprise for us as well uh, because in most other places it does come, uh, you know, so it, it shines through. Um, in jobs deemed hazardous, we only find two exceptions, which are Bihar and Jharkhand. Now, this is an interesting question to ask. Why did Bihar and Jharkhand not put in as many restrictions on uh, uh, heavy lifting as uh, other states? All other states um, pretty much either uh, have a uh, weight category difference between a drastic weight category difference between men and women. Some, of course, do quirky things uh, such as create distinctions between intermittent and continuous work and so on. Uh, on the parameter of uh, working in jobs deemed morally inappropriate, uh, Kerala, Goa, Himachal Pradesh, and Tamil Nadu do really well. Uh, they do allow women, or they don't put in as many restrictions on women, uh, at least in the excise laws uh, compared with all other laws. In the least free states are Chhattisgarh, West Bengal, Odisha. An interesting thing to notice as far as the least free states go, all three states have a large uh, country liquor uh, uh, you know, sort of production orientation, uh, particularly with traditional alcohol. So there is something uh, going on there. Funnily enough, of course, Goa and Himachal also have that. So I think it's worth, uh, sometimes it's, uh, some of these quirks may be worth looking a little bit deeper into. 
So I want to give you some examples so your, you know, sort of uh, blood boils the way mine does when I read some of these laws, right? Um, laws have been treating women as the exception. And this is something we know uh, from history, but I want to show you the ways in which it doesn't. Um, Section 27 of the Factories Act 1948. No woman, and what follows is what should bother us, no woman or child shall be employed in any factory for pressing cotton where a cotton opener is worn. So what is this equivalence between women and, uh, and children, right? Autonomous adults versus um, those whose agency has not been tested, whose risk appetite is not is yet to be tested. Section 22 of the Chhattisgarh Act 1950, license condition. The applicant shall not employ any salesman or representative who has a criminal background, who suffers from an infectious or contagious disease, is below 21, i.e. a child by any other woman, or a woman. So women's, you know, sort of equivalence with uh, absurd, absurd kinds of equivalence, right? I know that's not the intention, but it still begs a little bit of examination, a little bit of reflection, right? Section 8 of the Workmen's Compensation Act. Um, which is no part of a compensation uh, for in the case of injury to an employee uh, shall be paid to, typically this is a woman dependent, uh, to a woman or a person under legal disability. And in this case, a commissioner or somebody uh, with a, a sitting high on shall have the power to decide what will be done with this compensation. So completely taking away the agency without, again, uh, maybe with some uh, good intention, but it, it's, uh, it should hurt us that we think about it in this way. The executive gives itself enormous amounts of power as a gatekeeper. Uh, what do I mean by this, right? Law is supposed to be made by the people's representative. But of course, the executive, meaning the government, the state government, the central, the union government, and so on, have some role to make rules. And uh, it's in role in enforcing the laws that the people's representatives make. Sure, the people's rep representatives do make mistakes and oftentimes do make laws that we, we may not be comfortable with. But that is well square within their uh, mandate to do. The executive's place becomes a little bit more tricky, particularly when the executive is giving itself more and more and more power. Um, and the state, gov state governments and use their rulemaking powers. First, the laws themselves have restrictions. On top of it, the rules add on new restrictions. We'll give you some example, right? No provision in the Contract Labor Act, uh, to our understanding, empowers states to restrict women's for, uh, working hours. Across the board, you see that most rules for most states restrict uh, uh, female contract workers' working hours, particularly the night shift type of work. The argument isn't that women should be working in the night shift uh, you know, as contracted. That's not what we are uh, arguing about. But it begs the question, where did you get these powers to do this from? Sure, there is the catch-all, uh, you know, sort of clause that says any other matter that may be necessary. But is that the right thing to do? I think that, that that's important to answer. Um, similarly, the, in this particular case, the only thing that we could find is Section 12.2 of the Act, which uh, empowers the executive to draft conditions for, for a contractor's license. And that's the closest that we do. And what states end up doing is they, they use this provision to then curtail women's ability to work in the night shift by making it harder for employers uh, to uh, employ women in the night shift. This is fascinating and really annoying provision of Naukarnama, uh, which is, uh, this is again a feature, uh, how am I doing on time? Uh, I think I'm at 40, about 30 minutes. Yes, I will start, uh, wrap this up in, in a couple of yeah. In Yeah, five minutes. In five minutes, great. Uh, Nokanama, which is basically a permission to work. Uh, and this is particularly used in the case of, you know, sort of several uh, different uh, uh, occupations. But uh, in the excise laws, it is uh, deployed as a particular tool against or to restrict the, the employment of women. Laws keep women from entire chunks of the manufacturing process, from areas on the shop floor, from sophisticated machinery, from entire buildings and segments, right? We have documented 80 different processes across the country where women cannot work. Um, and again, this isn't to say that maybe some of these are not useful or don't have a rationale behind them, but nobody has articulated the rationale anywhere. Where do these powers come from? Are we just being conservative and saying it's easier for us to ring fence women than uh, men? 
And it should bother us because the use of and uh, uh, the ability to work on and to test sophisticated machinery is going to be an important part of their ability to be supervisors and eventually uh, rise up uh, in, in the ranks, or at least on the factory floor. I want to draw two minutes of attention to exemptions, to the story of exemptions, right? And Professor Patel, again, this relates to your uh, point earlier on gender uh, affiliated jobs, right? You will see across the board that uh, the government is concerned about women, except if they are nurses, midwives, working in creches or in canteens. Right? If that's uh, except in these cases, which are typically or women dominated or or women considered gender appropriate or whatever it is, uh, also in fish canning and curing, uh, in cinemas and theaters, like in so many places, very conveniently there is an exception given because you recognize that without women, some of these occupations wouldn't even uh, work. Um, I want to draw attention to the IT industry, the ITES industry across the country. You're seeing uh, that these, this industry has been exempt. I, I'm not drawing a, a cause, causal inference, but I just also want to make the point that this industry happens to be, uh, you know, sort of the, the highest female ratio industry, uh, female to male employer ratio, uh, employee ratio industry in India today. Ultimately, what's happening is there are two options that the government takes, either placing women in pedestals or in cages, right? So women don't have agency as, as themselves, uh, but uh, have to fulfill a certain role as preservers of the race or as mothers and housekeepers, but not as individuals. And typically the laws are weaponizing women's sort of vulnerability. Yes, uh, women on average cannot lift as much weight as men. Is this to say that every single woman should be precluded from this opportunity? In their reproductive functions and of course from their family responsibilities so oftentimes you will see the justification even in courts that the government gives uh, saying that but women have uh, family responsibilities it's not clear who the government is to uh, take a decision based on their understanding of women's uh, uh, family responsibilities it's not clear who this is serving or what uh, what uh, uh, outcomes this is giving us and i think that's the submission i want to make before uh, the plenary which is that I do think India needs to rethink this framework. Uh, and in some, in some ways, uh, I hope that Anisha and I will get a chance to work on this a little bit uh, going forward, which is to say that what has the impact been, right? What has it cost us to retain this? And places where it has been uh, you know, sort of released a little bit, where these chokeholds have been released, what are the benefits of this thing? With that, I will uh, end my presentation. Thank you for listening very patiently to me. Thank you very much, Bona, for making a brilliant presentation. And I think gave, you gave a panoramic view of how the labor uh, of labor jurisprudence in India, right, from 1823, uh, 1923 to 2022. So it's a really broad canvas that your study has covered. And other very important thing that came out is uh, uh, which are the some of this, the inter uh, subnational comparison of different states that certain states they are less restrictive. All over India, there is restriction, and there are, but only certain states have some relatively less number of restrictions. And I think your case you know, law analysis was extremely important, and I think that is going to be very, very useful to uh, even the labor lawyers and trade unions and uh, women's studies organizations. Your presentation took me back to 1982, where economists interested in women's issues group had fought against the language used in the labor department, Ministry of Labor and Law. And uh, women's uh, that they used to call uh, wherever women were more like in the agrarian sector and all they would call them women prone sector or women prone industry. So we had a massive fight with the planning commission, and this, and then after that it became women dominated. So language does convey the biases, and I think it's very important to that the especially the legal languages. And as you said, that laws are restrictive, but rules are even more restrictive. Now I would like to uh, ask. Uh, Dr. Yamini Atma will ask that how can legislation create an enabling ecosystem to challenge the what she showed, no? also the glass ceiling, sticky floor, glass walls, and leaky pipeline syndrome faced by women in the workforce. Yeah. And also labor, Hi. but they're those who are aspiring to get entered into the workforce. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. And first of all, let me just thank the Impri team, Vibhuti, um, Bhuvana, just everyone and colleagues for inviting me to part, be part of this conversation this morning. 
um, really enjoyed sort of going back to my women's studies classes um, when I was first getting into gender and employment and looking at uh, some of these questions. And um, it's incredible, as uh, Vibhuti said, how, <clears throat> you know, some things, many things have changed, but some things we seem to return to them in new ways and in interesting ways to sort of um, push those boundaries that gender norms, that institutions set for um, women and work. Um, and uh, I'll take a, I'll make a couple of quick broad comments and then come to the leg, the legis, how can legislation be enabling, right? I think overall, what this is telling us is bringing a, such a fresh perspective and when I start to think about, okay, what could employers do? What could states do? What could, you know, what are the different stakeholders there? And what is it that the different advocacy and action groups, the power groups actually be able to do around this? The possibilities are great, right? Like there are many, many possibilities to sort of in this moment in time to come back to these questions and really try to shift. Now, what legislation does is set a, um, uh, an overarching framework, right? I think there are, we don't know the direction, but they obviously state market laws, institutions, they reflect the same norms, values that um, society holds overall. It's not that they are immune to having um, biases and gender norms. I mean, the new multiple studies that have come out on uh, both the hiring biases, so in practice and in sort of way that, um, um, you know, um, norms can be quite informally uh, you know uh, reveal themselves through these kinds of experimental studies um the re most recent one being by the led by foundation uh, looking at uh, hiring biases against muslim women i think there's there's that entire sort of vertical or body of work that's incredibly sort of trying to tease out through different research methods how do we understand what's happening now, legislation is like it's right there, right? And so our analysis frameworks are the ones that are becoming more and more robust and really interesting. And I think, Bhuvna, what your, your work and the Treyas Foundation's work has really brought to the fore is this question that social norms, gender norms are not some archaic thing. They're not just in the private domain. I mean, this is something that women's movements have always talked about. I think all of us is feminist economists, uh, social researchers have continuously sort of underscored, but it needs to be said again, unfortunately, right? And so I think norms are not something that are just in the private domain. They're not just about something that happens within the household and the community. They are in the markets. <clears throat> and in this particular case, I think your, uh, you know, if I was sort of trying to think, okay, what are the dimensions that are emerging? And if we start to see sort of, you know, time, women's time uh, as a major sort of capability or resource, whatever framework we want to use, women's time, women's bodies, um, so your health, your ability, though, you know, and then technology, right? Like there are three or four dom like nodes at which we can anchor how some of these laws and these uh, laws seem to be uh, positioning uh, women as workers and have certain definitions of them and they seem to want to constrain and take a protectionist view or, you know, uh, uh, I think largely a protectionist view, I suppose, but it ends up obviously um, being very exclusionary and <clears throat> actually, um, actually have costs. So I think what you ended on is the really critical piece. In terms of, um, um, and I think, I mean, Vibhuti is such an expert, you've written so much on this. We all have read how appropriate technology, technology transfer to women, upskilling of women is such a critical piece. Um, I mean, time and unpaid work and night shift is one part that I think we've talked about more than we do about the gender norms around technology and restricting technology access. And so I think what you've done is add this very interesting you know, element to it, saying there's actually even prescriptions that seem to restrict. So even where you have a factory context, which is a very rare thing in the world of working women, you have a factory context, you have a factory that's employing women, and yet there is a restriction on what is it that women can actually skill themselves in, right? Um, and I think this, this sort of dialectic you position where in Factories Act are so protectionist, but we are totally fine with the 95% of women in the informal sector, you know, 
facing similar kinds of hazards, facing multiple sort of work hours, conditions of work, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that we absolutely, that that's very clear and comes out in your report. Now, what laws can do are also, you know, there are two things, right? That one, I think changing laws can be an incredible changer of norms and society itself. Take the child marriage law, for example, just the issue of child marriage or girls education, right? Um, so child marriage, as we sort of start to see changes in legislation, society and norms have changed. There may be still like a 16 to 18 uh, sort of a bracket where girls are still getting married, but you are generally seeing a change. Or you can see many of those anthropological studies that show how market demand for women, girls work and employment, whether it's garment industries, et cetera, those can also change now. They can also have sanction for delaying marriage, for um, allowing girls to sort of migrate for work, et cetera, et cetera, right? So norms follow certain kinds of changes that legislation, markets have the power to actually set in motion. Now it can happen the other way also, but in this case, I think Vibhuti's question is so pertinent. How can law, you know, what does, legislation mean for us? One, it signals to us that, as you have said, there are distinctions made between different kinds of citizens. And where those can be highlighted and brought to the foreground, we have constitutional laws that tell us that we should be treated equally. And so there is an intrinsic value to it. The other part of it is it can trigger a lot of large scale change and positive change. And I think I'd like to focus on that and say, you know, the time for that change is very, very important and immediate because that change can really, I mean, whether we want to talk instrumentally about the demographic dividend and or we want to talk about COVID recovery and how do we make, um, you know, the economic growth happen better, or you talk about opportunities for vulnerable women to actually get access to decent work. So whichever angle we take, I think these kinds of um, triggers can really help bring about large scale change in ways that no action on smaller organizations advocacy agendas can do so i think that's the potential of this um i'll stop there i have a couple of more points but can come back to it uh, in terms of just my comment thank you vibhuti vibhuti you're on mute ma'am please unmute yeah. So thank you, Dr. Yamini, uh, bringing out a very important uh, concern about uh, what, how the laws can trigger massive change. Uh, but uh, at, at the same time, currently the laws are infantilizing women. They are not treating women as full citizens. So that is also, and I think now it becomes our duty to reach out to the uh, law commission because we have the we have women's movement has been doing that right from the late 70s, interacting with them. But I think we'll have to intensify our interaction in the And plus there is a global pressure also, World Economic Forum and all, all of them. There's a lot of naming and shaming of India that has done. Uh, so I think the, the current, the, 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 this is the right time to have discourse on this aspect. Uh, of uh, how the legal reforms, they also <laughs> need to be non-discriminatory because we all boast about the legal reforms, but there is a, still a discrimination. So now, Dr. Uh, Ash, uh, Ashmita Sir Sharma, how can the sectoral and profession skews in the macroeconomy can be addressed by legislation? And what are the employers organization doing to increase work participation of women? I believe you have been doing research on uh, women in the workforce. so. Hopefully, you have also interacted with the employers' organization. Has their mindset changed? Um, thank you very much, Professor Patel. Uh, and thank you, Impri, for inviting me um, to this event. Uh, it was a really interesting talk. Bhuvana and I have been talking a lot about her research, which I think is really fascinating. Uh, I was really struck, even again, I mean, I've read the report, but even in this presentation, once again, struck um, particularly by the fact that restrictions or these legal restrictions exist only in sectors that are, are male dominated uh, and not in sectors which are particularly feminized, you know, nursing, uh, care, uh, and so on. Uh, and so this really reinforces, I think, what Yamini just said, which is that, you know, these, these, uh, these laws are really just reflecting back norms that, uh, that, that we have already uh, and indeed leading to their intensification um, in society. So uh, I'll get to Professor Patel's question just a bit, but I want to talk a little bit about some research that I'm doing um, right now that relates very strongly to this question of occupational choice. 
uh, and how it is inherently feminized or masculinized in a country like India. And this is research I'm doing with my colleague, Dr. Ashmi Deshpande, and actually we're working quite closely with Yamini and her organization Circle In on this um, to try and understand how we can better match um, women's uh, uh, skills to uh, employers' demands for those skills. Um, a, lot of, a lot of what we're hearing from employers is that, oh, we'd love to hire women uh, if only we had women of the right kinds of skills out there. Um, and part of the reason this exists, of course, is precisely because we have, um, you know, driven in these, these norms or these, these uh, 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 you know, kind of tendencies to push women towards only a limited number of sectors uh, just because they are appropriate for women. You know, you should become a nurse or maybe a teacher. Uh, and pushing them away from acquiring skills in uh, in areas where they can get jobs that are relatively more productive and that actually pay more. Um, and so how can we get women to move uh, into acquiring skills which will make them more employable uh, for the kinds of jobs that we we think employers are looking for? Um, this, is, uh, this is a really tricky question. One of the things that we want to do is uh, see if exposing not just women, young women, but their families as well, to information about uh, what the different returns to you know, investing in different skills could be. So for example, um, you know, what, what are the job opportunities that could open up for you if you were to learn data entry? You know, what are the job opportunities that could open up for you if you learn how to use the computer? Um, and uh, 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 how, what are the job opportunities that could open up to you if you learn how to be mobile, you know, just get a driver's license or learn how to ride a scooter, you know, something like that. Um, it will exposing these young women and more importantly, their families to these kinds of returns make them more um, uh, enthusiastic about allowing their daughters or their sisters or their wives um, to acquire skills uh, that, that are relatively more valued by the market. Um, this translates also to entrepreneurship. Um, a lot of women are self-employed um, and running businesses, but predominantly these businesses tend to be in areas that are allied with, uh, with women's skills, right? Women-focused work. So for example, most women-run businesses uh, are in textiles or in tailoring or in food production uh, or agri-related you know, uh, services. So can we, um, can we encourage women again to invest in skills uh, or allow them to invest in skills that will allow them to diversify the range of businesses that they operate in. And again, can this be done by really just exposing women, not just to information, but to role models of other women who have succeeded in this area or to networks, women run networks where you are in touch with other business uh, owners um, uh, who, who can handhold, who can assist and who can mentor through these processes. Um, I think, you know, it would be really interesting to see if any of this can help shift um, the kinds of skills that women acquire, um, which can then better align them to what employers claim they want to hire, right? Um, so that's one line of work that we've been looking at um, on the, uh, well, I don't know if I want to call this the demand side, but certainly the matching side, you know, uh, how we are matching available skills in the market to, um, to what employers are looking for. Um, I think in the area of, um, of, of laws and whether laws can change uh, substantively the kind of employment opportunities that are available for women. I think um, one kind of interesting law has been for me, the prevention of sexual harassment in the workplace act, right? This was passed in 2013 um, as a moral imperative, right? And this is something that we absolutely need just to make women safe in the workplace, but it also has some potentially interesting economic implications. Uh, if women were staying out of work because they felt that uh, workplaces were just not safe enough for them or their families were not convinced that workplaces were safe enough for them, then presumably making workplaces more safe for women could have the impact of drawing more women into the workplace. Um, but anecdotally, it seems that the provisions of this act have been very unevenly enforced. And this act came out in 2013. It's now almost a decade. Um, but there's been a very kind of mixed response from firms in terms of implementation. Uh, you have some very progressive firms, um, including those with an international presence that are very keen to highlight how they have, you know, followed the, uh, all the requirements of the law. Um, there are others that have maybe set up a complaints committee, but haven't done enough in terms of actually running workshops or gender sensitization programs or informing or training workers about recognizing and cutting down um, sexual harassment in the workplace. And at one end, you have, you know, retailers, shops, um, smaller establishments that still fall within the ambit of the law, but don't even know, you know, uh, what they're required to do. 
And so in, 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 uh, in a new research project um, with Laurie Beeman and Carmini Sharma, we are looking at whether, um, uh, we're looking to try and understand why firms are so hesitant to implement the different provisions of the law. And if they can be encouraged to do so, will it even have an impact in terms of women joining uh, the workforce, right, in larger numbers? And I think this also speaks to this larger question of, of what can legal change bring us or what can legislative change bring us? Obviously, it's a core component um, uh, of any kind of policy prescription that we have here. Um, but also, uh, once we introduce these legal changes, what can we really hope to see? Is it sufficient to just change the law or is there additional support that's required? So in the case of firms and sexual harassment, why is it that they are not um, uh, following the law? Is it because there are some costs associated with it that the lawmakers did not foresee? Um, and is there something that can be done about these regulatory costs? Um, is it that they don't think women care? And so this is not something they need to bother with because the job seekers they are looking to employ uh, don't really care about this. Um, and is that something that can be addressed in terms of their perceptions? Um, or is it that they feel that it is stigmatizing uh, to their reputation to try and highlight uh, issues around workplace safety? Um, and so I think trying to understand firm behavior uh, and employer behavior becomes really critical in this environment. And so as Bhuvana alluded to right at the end, um, we are hopefully you know, going to be able to work together to try and understand what the impact of shifting um, restrictions on women's work, uh, Factories Act, Shops and Establishments Act, all of the kind of restrictions that Bhuvana laid out so well. Um, what, are the, what has removing those restrictions meant for women's employment in the last five to 10 years, uh, which is when the scale of change really began to pick up pace? Um, you know, on the one hand, um, it, it would seem obvious that these are constraints, at least on paper, to women working in factories. But in terms of actual numbers on the ground, will we see an increase in women in sectors that are non-traditionally not hiring lots of women just because of this change in the law? And I think that's going to be important to see. Um, uh, that will also help us understand a little bit more about employer behavior. You know, what can employers do uh, in order to bring more women um, into the workforce? Um, I know we've talked mainly uh, about kind of legal uh, and institutional frameworks here. Um, just yesterday, there was a really interesting article uh, in the Hindustan Times that looks at recent PLFS data on why women say they don't work. Uh, and overwhelming reason put forward by women was uh, that they have family duties to take care of. So while these constraints are obviously important, the background and the context to this still remains um, an environment where women have a lot of claims on their time. And um, I think trying to understand what employers can do about this in terms of offering remote work options, in terms of offering more flexible hours, um, in terms of retraining women who drop out of the workforce when the claims on their time increase the most, particularly when they've had children, and see if they can re-enter the workforce at an older age. I think these are also some exciting possibilities that could perhaps in the short to medium run um, generate more employment for women. I think the retrain, bringing back women is particularly interesting. I think a lot of our focus as, uh, as uh, researchers, as policymakers tends to be on the 15 to 25 year old age group. Um, but I wonder if we shouldn't also um, uh, you know, shift our focus to an older age group, 35 plus, you know, women who've had children uh, and who are potentially more able to come back into the workforce um, provided that they have the kinds of skills that uh, that, that employers value. Um, so I'm going to stop here. Um, this has been a really great discussion. Um, it's been I, I'm very glad to be a part of this uh, this forum with such great speakers on it. Um, and uh, I hope to you know hear more about what Thrayas is doing in the coming years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Anisa. Uh, I think you brought in very important. What I liked about your presentation is that what we need is additional support. So I think even if you have a workplace safety or even commuting from home to work, that is now given as a major reason that uh, street harassment, harassment while commuting, whether they are bus, so recent cases of, if you see last six months cases of sexual violence or kidnap, all of them are related to women reporting for work, a nurse or an Anganwadi worker or ASHA worker or a woman in informal sector while going from home to workplace she faces harassment. So I think the, the responsibility of the community and also the, uh, uh, the criminal justice system no, about providing uh, the CCTV camera is not a solution. 
What we need is that we need to make our smart cities. Uh, they should be safe cities rather than uh, smart cities. No, so that is a one very important. And what you are talking about the uh, responsibility, you no, know, of a care work. So I think we also it's not only that what employers should do give a more flexibility or part time work or this, but also mindset of the people also has to change. So we need to have a very important public education campaign uh, about that. It is a uh, housework is everybody's work. So I think uh, th that also can uh, and, and sharing of uh, family responsibility, housework, elderly care, child care. I think that also becomes very important because just 50 years back, Scandinavian countries started that, no, with the right from early childhood education and now the mindset has changed. So I think the challenge is yeah, manifold and I think you all have really enriched the discussion. Now the floor is open for question answer. Uh, we have, uh, I don't see any question in the chat box or in Q&A box, uh, but uh, participants, if you have any questions or you want to intervene or enrich the discussion, you are free to do that. I see Dr. Minakshi Gopinath, who is also here, the chairperson of a section report, and would, would you like to make your comments? Dr. Minakshi Gopinath, are you there? Please unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you. We can hear you, ma'am. Please go ahead. She's uh, she's mute. Huh? Okay. This, is, now she's unmute. this has yes. been an absolutely fascinating discussion. And, uh, you know, every time I join one of your uh, curated talks, Vibhuti, I come away with so much under so much better understanding of the state uh, the issues at stake and i really want to thank each of the speakers bhuvna yamini and, and also anisha for uh, for actually looking at the really highlighting the difference between niti and nyay yeah. the slippage you know between law and justice and how you know in the interstices between law and justice is where most of uh, women's absence from the workforce or their growing retreat, if you want to call it that, or invisibility uh, uh, is really beginning to locate itself. And that interstices, interstices is widening as the days go by. As uh, Bhuvna said, it's not just an Indian phenomenon, but it is stark here because of the intersectionalities that we confront, uh, much more stark. Um, and I, and of course, you are better aware than I am as to how the doubly disadvantaged have become triply disadvantaged as a result of COVID and how these have had a dramatic impact on the cleavages in society. The inequalities have grown. So your idea about, about stepping up the campaign and in fact, going to every college, every university, every space of discourse, just putting out this this information and this really fantastic report on the state of discrimination, you know, would be just, and I would, would request uh, Dr. Arjun Kumar to actually pitch, to do something at the Center for Policy Research uh, with you, Vibhuti, and the very, uh, very, very eminent speakers here who bring such a wealth of experience and I really want to thank you as they say the eyes of my the eye of my eyes have opened and I really take away a lot from this conversation thank you ever so much are there any other participant want to speak or we can ask the panelist uh, to respond thank you Dr. Minakshi Gopinathan for a very inspiring feedback it always gives me energy. <laughs> yes, Bhuvna, please go ahead. I actually uh, want to circle back to Yamini. Uh, Yamini, at the, at the end of your remarks, you had said there are a couple of more points. You are not audible. No. I'm not audible now. Yeah. You are now. yeah. Please be loud. Yeah. Yes, sorry. Uh, I want to circle back to Yamini. Uh, Yamini, at the end of your remarks, you had said there are a couple more points I want to make. So maybe we can use this time and uh, hear sure. those. Uh, and I think from Anisha as well, right? I think one of the things Anisha, you and I have talked about is the law, norm, employer behavior, that continuum 
and how do we, uh, you know, what are the elements of the continuum that we can perhaps intervene or what are the intervention designs uh, that we can think about? Maybe that's something that I'd like to hear from you uh, as well. Um, uh, sure, thanks. Bhuvana. I may just add another question to Bhuvanas. Yeah. You know, this whole business of the, uh, shall I say, the enlightened employer, Mm -hmm. uh, their own, not just their self-perceptions, it is not that they are all ill-intentioned and that they're deliberately keeping uh, women out of certain areas of work. It's just also combined, of course, with the socialization into patriarchy. That's one aspect. Uh, and it, it is in because it's invisible, it's also much more lethal. But also their lack of appreciation of their complicity in a process of discrimination. Because, you know, employers always feel they are giving people access and opportunity. There is a very paternalistic uh, patronizing, if you want to call it that, um, sort of um, a resonance to what they do. So it is impossible for them to think that they're actually contributing to further discrimination. So I'm wondering whether some kind of training or I, I don't know how you bring, uh, you know, you do away with this kind of. Um, lack of understanding, uh, lack of self-awareness, uh, and also bring into the trajectory of employment certain limit, a, a set of minimal protocols uh, that even the employers uh, are sort of have, uh, do have to comply with. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I butted in, but thank yeah, you. No, that's a very important point. Not at all. Uh, should I go? Professor? Please, please go ahead. So um, you brought in a really important point, Dr. Manakshi. And so let me, I'll just make, I sort of jotted down, I'll make five very short points so that um, we can follow up later and, um, and can also uh, listen to Anisha. I think the first one is, um, I mean, your framing is around discrimination, right? So as we sort of start to peel away the layers, I think the question is, you know, how far can we go? Could we bring in more intersectional understandings? I mean, this is your starting. I think it's a great effort. So, you know, what do you, you know, is there a, is there a longer term agenda as we start to see discrimination along multiple axes, other axes, you know, how do we put something together that is um, actually talking, telling us about, um, you know, what that continuum looks like and where is, where are the, places that one can intervene in this current moment, right? That is beneficial to us, beneficial to the social groups, beneficial to the economy, et cetera, et cetera. So whichever instrumentalist or otherwise uh, one meeting. The second one, I think picking up on just this um, work that you and Anisha are going to follow up on. And uh, I mean, it's something that's come up a lot as we have been trying to think about our agenda and at Circle in sort of thinking about how do we work with employers? How do we and also ties with uh, Dr. Minakshi's point, like, you know, is there a is there a real understanding of because there will be stated lack of preference, right? There'll be stated preferences for we don't need women because, you know, it costs too much. I don't need to pay a gratuity. I don't want to give a maternity benefit. That's the other side of it, right? The other big cost, so-called cost driver, um, allegedly of uh, uh, employing women. So. You know, is it worth sort of thinking through and looking through the literature or just thinking about a way, uh, Anisha and Bhuvana, that one could actually sort of see, you know, where is it, where is it discourse, where is it real, like how do we understand the cost to the employer for um, employing women? I mean, it seems like a, something we should not be working on, but we clearly need to sort of think through this if we want to make them partners in the change, right? Like you want to take them with you because not all of them are big employers. Many are very, very small firms, small enterprises. Many are women-owned enterprises. And there's a very interesting sort of mixed evidence on do women employ more women? Do they create better conditions of work for other women? Like, so there's a, you know, there's multiple directions one could go in. So I think the question of like, is there a real cost um, of whichever sub, whatever it is that they need to do in terms of social um, you know, social protection, legislation, etc. is something that's just worth thinking about conceptually. Is it worth doing? And should we be thinking about some of these? Because they can be really strong advocacy agendas. If we can push and say, you know, for, a, you know, this much, you're actually getting productive women who are working, they'll, they stay longer at the workplace, they're ready to be mobile, etc., etc. then that's a good thing, right? Like you can actually show a very positive effect. The third point I wanted to make is on the state context. 
the state comparisons right now is quite, I mean, you're looking at it across the 2024 20, states that you got the data for, but obviously the economic context, the sector. So I think that's work you're anyway going to do with Anisha. I would love to sort of um, follow up on that and stay in touch because I think it's so important to see the so what of it, um, both in terms of how does it, you know, any a slice in time, like right now, as well as historically has that um, where there's been change, has that really been accompanied by other things or how much of this matters, right? Like what's the relative weight of this vis-a-vis -vis other factors that actually support women's labor force participation. The last I think is just coming back to this employer question because I think I think that is really important for us to think about and engage um, uh, employer groups on this is, is it capacity or is it incentives? Is it something else? Like where is, what is it that actually would change the preference? Now the legal piece I think is to me, that's a beyond the employer that is actually about a broader framing within which employers, all different actors um, position themselves and are negotiating and trying to work out cost benefits and numbers and revenues and this and that, right? So. So I think as we want to bring employers on board, even where you have progressive legislation, I'm not, I'm assuming that that's not giving us big gains in LFP. So how do we then work with employers in a way and what is it that will work? And I think there's a really interesting agenda one could shape um, already Ashoka's work is um, on that track, but we can deepen our thinking, especially around these questions. So those were my additional few points. Thank you. Yeah. But Dr. Yamini, we have also noticed no, that 40% of women with MBA degrees have to sit at home. And I think their yeah. that employer's prejudices are very strong. These are the highly uh, qualified women. And still, because yeah. of the gender norms, they are not being able. Yeah. There are some comments in chat box. Banara and Barman writes that the recent labor code, which proposes to dilute the regulation for employers as those uh, sector constitute less than 300 employees can lock out and staff uh, lay off without notice, this will go uh, to effect, to affect adversely Indian women workers. And Priya Suman has commented that this dilution might be helpful to simplify the rigidity uh, in being formal sector. Conse uh, consequently, it might enhance the percentage of formal sector in the context of women. There are various provisions in care of women, uh, which includes crash facilities at the work sites, maternity leave, equal remuneration, implementation of equal remuneration act, and the time put in. Uh, in on a Facebook Live, there are comments uh, by Amita Arya. What about the use of right technology, which makes work safe, safer? And the second comment is again by the Amita Arya that there can be no moral judgment on the type of work. But if there is, uh, but there is no equal, equality if only women are preferred in any service industry or are excluded from service industry. So please take into consideration these comments. And now, uh, Dr. Anisha, would you like to speak? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'll just be brief. I mean, um, this: how do we get employers to change behavior? I mean, this is a key question, and I think it ties quite closely to what. Um, what Yamini was talking about in terms of costs, because when you try and engage with the private sector to say, hey, let's come up with a plan for hiring more women, they'll always come back or many of them will come back with, uh, well, it's too expensive or it's too costly. Um, you know, uh, here's the issue of the bottom line. Attrition is really high. Women will leave us and we spend all our money training them and then they leave us anyway. So um, uh, part of this is that, you know, maybe we shouldn't be taking uh, this statement of costs on face value. Uh, and this is something that we are thinking about quite seriously with respect to our sexual harassment study. How do we design a survey that appropriately captures why um, uh, hiring managers aren't hiring women um, without just, you know, kind of hearing their usual growth stories about, um, you know, uh, women, it's a supply side issue or their costs in terms of women quitting because they have children and so on. Um, that is challenging for sure. Um, but that is something that we are trying to seriously address um, in terms of eliciting truthful uh, revelation from, uh, from hiring managers. Um, but going beyond that, um, I think, you know, one approach that, that we have thought about, and this is, you know, part of a project on, on trying to get firms to provide amenities in the workplace that will increase the number of women who want to work for them and get firms to more directly hire more women. Um, I think, 
showing a proof of concept may be very useful here. So if most firms believe that, look, it's too expensive to hire women, um, you know, finding a few partners who are willing to be champions uh, and show that this can be done, I think that's going to be important. So basically start change with a small number of role models who can make a case for hiring women successfully, showing that they are good workers for all kinds of reasons and that it doesn't affect their bottom line, and then using them to try and motivate change across the sector could be one way of doing this. Um, of course, that's easier said than done because with a lot of these large firms, especially where employment is being generated in, in large numbers, where impact is possible, um, you know, they don't even recruit themselves entirely and they, they control uh, white collar hiring maybe, uh, but large manufacturing firms outsource blue collar hiring to these various micro contractors spread all across cities. And those guys, I mean, you know, then you need to negotiate and talk to them because they, of course, believe that, well, of course, we, you know, only hire men who hires women for these kinds of jobs. Anyway, we know where to go, or which labor job to go to or which organization to go to or which village to go to or whatever to hire more, uh, uh, more men. And so it's not just about going to a big MNC. Uh, it's also about figuring out the entire supply chain of hiring women um, across all of their different verticals, particularly if you want to have an impact in blue collar hiring. Um, and so I think we will get more buy in faster with white collar hires, um, especially on the issue that Professor Patel just raised of bringing back MBAs, but the highly skilled women, basically bringing them back into the fold. Uh, I know in the IT industry, there's a lot of effort to try uh, and bring back women who've dropped out of the labor market for all sorts of reasons, typically family reasons or whatever it is, bringing them back in after a short spell, giving them the confidence that they need uh, to, to, to realize that, look, uh, you know, they still have those skills and they just need to kind of brush up in order to be able to come back in. So there is effort there. Um, and I think, again, that that's a useful source uh, of, of impact. But doing it across blue collar jobs will be just much more challenging because there's so many more stakeholders that we'll have to engage with. Yeah. Can we ask for quota in stand up India, scale India, startup India? Because that's what highly competent many of our friends who are MTech and BTech from IITs, when they send the proposal, it is not considered to be viable, no, always, though they the, the viable. So for when it comes to women entrepreneurs, can we ask for quota from the government in, in any tender? for all these missions no, that the state has. Because you talk about women entrepreneurship, but we have only 8% of women who are the entrepreneurs among all. No? And their capacity of investment is between 50,000 to 2 lakhs, not more. So when the banks are also so averse to support them. I think there already are some, uh, some uh, positive uh, uh, incentives. I think Bhuvana may know more, but there already are uh, incentives given by MSMEs, uh, women-owned uh, MSMEs in terms of uh, increasing procurement from women-owned firms and so on. Um, I mean, the, the, the first immediate issue is that there's so few of them and they're so small that the government will just not be able to meet its own targets if they were to only buy from uh, women-owned industries. So uh, I think, again, the same issue of providing a lot more support um, include to make these incentives more useful, um, you know, that support will have to come first to grow those businesses. The handholding from beginning to yeah, yeah, and capacity. Yeah, yeah, very important. My view is a little different. Uh, these kinds of incentives haven't worked in the past, and I don't see uh, a strong, you know, sort of theory of change for why they will. Uh, we have a deeper, much deeper problem. It's, I don't think it's a women entrepreneurship. That's my, you know, sort of. Is no, it's not a women entrepreneurship problem. It's a women in the pipeline problem. And in some ways, how do you get started on being in, think about a road contracting business for women, right? Now for women, women aren't being involved in laying roads. The, the, the chances that they're going to be active uh, entrepreneurs eventually recognizing that business opportunity and then being able to follow through on it, in, in my view is fairly low. I think there's a, pipeline story here and the entrepreneurship story, yes, it's grating. And sure, there should be more women entrepreneurs, but I don't think you can short circuit that that pipeline problem that we have. Uh, and if, if we are to focus on the one thing or the one place where you're likely to get uh, big changes and big uh, rewards as a result, it's the workforce story. And I would urge that we, you know, sort of train our eyes on that part of the spectrum. Uh, rather than the women entrepreneurs part of the spectrum, because many more women who need jobs or uh, are, could be value addition to the workforce and so on and so forth. Right? I do want to make sort of one 
slightly perhaps unpopular uh, uh, remark, right? It's, it's true. It seems distasteful to us that employers react or are acting in a certain way. But beyond that distastefulness, is it how do we unpack, you know, even setting our own uh, distaste for it, uh, for it aside and unpack what's going on? So it's it's one thing to say that, you know, uh, it's one, one way of looking at it is that their knowledge is poor, their understanding is not that great, or that, of course, there's culture and baggage and so on. But it's another thing to say, what are their real preferences telling us beyond their uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, cultural preferences, perhaps, or beyond their lack of knowledge. And I suspect that while they may not be able to articulate the knowledge very well, that there is something that they are telling us about the practical difficulties in the stories there. And if we are to make a meaningful uh, intervention, unpacking that in a thoughtful way is going to be important. Otherwise, we're going to learn more of what we already know. Uh, and that's not necessarily going to, uh, you know, sort of create larger change. So how do we do that unpacking, particularly on the question of costs, right? Uh, is it really costly? That's one question, one part of the question. And what ways does the cost manifest, right? And it, the answer may not be as simple, uh, or it may be very hard to unpack. So I'm thinking about the sexual harassment story, right? Um, and thinking about what are the ways in which you would understand if it is hard for firms to implement these kinds of things. Um, for example, just looking back at cases on, uh, under the sexual harassment law and just going back to courts and saying, what has happened? Uh, and maybe that gives us some insight to be able to understand why are employers fighting this so hard or why are they finding it difficult? And the one more thought that came to my mind just as I was hearing that is there are some striking examples before us where it is working, that there, there is something that's happening differently, right? I won't take names, but one of India's largest confectioners has managed to bring in an extraordinary amount of diversity to their workplace, particularly in the case of uh, uh, sex, right? Um, I think it's worth studying why they're able to do what they're able to do as a very close practice. Um, the second is, of course, the IT industry. The third is the textile hubs in India, like Tirupur in Tamil Nadu, right? Um, it's really worth looking at what's going on there that, that's different or flying in the face of all other patterns that we are seeing. So I, I think we do have some nice examples and spending, uh, you know, sort of some amount of time in understanding and unpacking them may also be very valuable. The textile industry in Tamil Nadu, and I think even Haryana is emulating that model, no? Uh, Sum Sumangali model in Tamil Nadu and uh, uh, Sukanya model in, uh, but I think uh, the problem of uh, labor relations, labor processes, the workload, uh, question of decent work, ILO standard to be implemented. I think that Padmini Swaminathan and Anandi Madras Institute of Development Studies have done a lot of studies. So we'll have to also focus on that, that when you see women as a most vulnerable workforce, no, which can work under a very controlled situation, then the question of human rights and also the question of uh, 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 this you know, women's freedom, because they are also, it is a dormitory model no, where women are staying on the factory premises and so that also needs to be and here it is not the employer who is behaving like that is a state state is facilitating it is in the free trade zone and in the special economic zone. So, that is, yeah. so now can we have a round of uh, for all three of you about the way ahead can you just tell in two minutes what are, what do you what are your most important highlights for the future Bhuvana, start. Sure. Uh, and I think this is um, some overlap between the three of us, and I'm hoping that we get a chance to pursue a work program long term. One of the things that we're looking at very closely is uh, what next, what can we do with the state of discrimination index and data that we've collected, either to build on it further. Uh, Anisha has, uh, you know, sort of been saying to us that we need to create, do a historical recreation uh, of what's happened in the past. We also have the new labor codes as somebody in chat just uh, mentioned. Uh, there is a national experiment to follow, right? The before and the after. Uh, and for us, we want to bring in uh, um, a data lens to the story. What are the, has it changed? How much of a role does this play? Uh, where it has changed? Has it been beneficial? In what ways it has been beneficial? Uh, so that's certainly a work program uh, that we're uh, oriented towards 
Um, the other is the employer cost story, uh, some of the cost of regulation story, which is particularly uh, in the case of some of the protective legislations. Um, I want to give you one, hopefully add some levity to the proceedings. Um, we studied a whole bunch of conditions that, uh, that are imposed on firms if they want to employ women. This includes you know, safe transport, you've got to send a car back and forth, you've got to do pickups and drop-offs, you've got X, Y, Z, like the, there are a whole host of these. And we uh, spoke with a number of firms and uh, CHROs and so on and so forth. And we heard some hilarious stories, right? That, well, one part of it, they're deeply disturbing on women's agency. Um, uh, but the other part of it is they're also just kind of, they, they tell you the impossibility that employers face sometimes. Um, so for example, one of the conditions across states is uh, you have got to uh, be dropped off in a company car uh, at X and Y time and only to your place of residence, no other place. Uh, and the only exception to that is if a family, uh, a blood relative, comes to uh, pick you up or drop you off. Um, and it turns out that uh, firms will always say, right, every day there is new blood relatives that are coming. The number of cousins keeps on growing. <laughs> it's also um, a funny part of women's agency that we don't tend to think about. Um, so her, the, the phrase they use is a little bit cruder. They said, har, har naye cousin aa jate hai pe, uh, lene ke liye or drop karne ke liye. Um, and hostel I think ka, hostel ka problem. <laughs> Even in hostel, no? When I was in the hostel committee of university. You know, yeah. So uh, I think understanding the cost of those regulations from that point of view as well, from an agency point of view. What is it doing? What are these cameras doing to women on uh, campus, right? Or uh, to employers or to the interactions between the sexes and so on and so forth. So that's certainly on our mind uh, uh, for uh, a broader um, investigation. Not of Yeah, um, thank you. And I think Bhuvna has very nicely laid out a roadmap for uh, next steps on this. Um, to that, I would just add um, some work that we're doing, I mean, in partnership with CEDA and others that we're, as we develop the work is sort of this larger agenda. I think Anisha nicely laid that out on, you know, how do we understand the positive outliers, the exemplar employers who seem to have done, a, you know, set up factories for women who seem to be setting these up? I mean, again, just trying to understand that landscape, right? So you learn from the negativity, you learn, I mean, the negative experience, you learn from the gaps, but you also can learn from success stories or seeming success stories and try to unpack those. So I think I think there's a interesting sort of way to build that narrative uh, for us. The second is, um, yeah, I mean, to the cost story, I think that's something very dear to uh, how I want to take some of this forward and would love to talk to Bhuvana and Anisha on how you're shaping this next uh, and even Vibhuti I mean I think it's also about the cost benefit right the opportunity costs in some ways like how do we frame that is it the social value is it I mean I always get asked now is gender like the is there an economic value is it is socially valuable is it intrinsic is it something actually useful so I think we just have to take this these questions uh, by the horns and um, and really face it because I think methodologically we are we have strong strong sort of abilities and methods that help us uh, put this together so maybe we do a little bit of that kind of uh, prep work and it's you know we can do we can really sort of see opportunity costs for women and an opportunity cost for employers so for the different stakeholders like what's the gain what's the loss and where is it ideal where is it sort of more discourse and ideology and where do we where can we do corrections right and then what are the positive nudges you put into place what are some real laws or um, you know policy changes that are needed and where is it a more um, you know, cloak and daggers that you actually you have some sense of something, but you're not. It's not actually rooted in anything like tangible or actual like calculate. No one is sitting down and calculating it. It's more that this is the norm, right? And so you go on. So I think unpacking all of that feels like a really important uh, piece to do. The third, I'll just say, our framing is COVID recovery, right? Uh, I mean, there's enough data around there telling us women are not getting back opportunities not getting into the workforce again even as some men are 
so what what is that structure of the economy going to look like and therefore then what kind of efforts should we be making i mean is labor intensive manufacturing labor intensive um you know is that sort of a you know where india should be headed if that's the case then i think we should be thinking about factory services and trying to de bottleneck as much as possible women's entry to it so the lower the cost lower the uh, normative barriers as well as um increase sort of the enabling environment for that um and if it is a mix of things including entrepreneurship then how do we actually uh, have a framing that tells us you know there is you know there are barriers across and so and i think time women's unpaid work time is sort of now becoming something that a lot of this is getting hinged on because as always when it comes to crises women's time is what and women's um, ability to take on those unpaid tasks is what we're all depending on thank you so the panel has also brought in the question of decentralized production and also uh, the uh, uh, handling the supply chain no so that is That's also a very important challenge we face and i think many manufacturers at least in western india they are saying that they would employ more robo because they can't have so many workers in the same premises because pandemics are going to be endemics uh, epidemics and pandemic both so at least in surat because surat had experienced plague all in 1994 you know after that the whole city got reorganized and it is 55% of the workers in surat city are migrant workers too and it's a textile hub so they said that uh, they can't just have in a small big hall uh, in a one hall they can't have 3 400 workers instead they would have 100 workers they would maintain the distance but they would also have a massive automation and also one robot one worker so machine learning and all that will be introduced mm. that's what they are thinking in that direction employers or organizations yeah. yes dr anita yeah i think you know across the panel we've all laid out a pretty ambitious uh, program of uh, of research into changing employer behavior changing women's skills changing legal frameworks and so on um i would just add one more thing that i think is really important looking forward um you know, you know bhuvana hasn't really talked that much about it here but um collecting this data was a pretty back breaking task and uh, you know thrice just done an extraordinary job uh, of collecting data not just on legal changes which is i guess a little more straight forward but just understanding the the way government regulations and exemptions work tracking them all down collecting information on them has just been a huge task uh, as she has explained how many us. rtis they had to file i don't know we have not asked <laughs> um, we did rti routes so even harder we get to go and do it do all the fact finding ourselves thank you so So I think collecting this kind of data going forward is critical, um, and I I hope Trias and others, and I hope government can can start to make this information more easily available themselves in a, a you know a straightforward digital format. Um, uh, you know when an exemption has been made, when a change has been made. I think this is really useful and important data to collect going forward. Um, and of course, you know Trias will be trying to reconstruct historically as well. But certainly going forward, I think it's 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 critical to keep collecting this information. um and i would add to that a second point is that you know obviously we are interested in estimating credibly what the impact of changing these laws will be but another really interesting political economy question is that why is why and how do some governments ease up uh, and introduce these exemptions and why do some governments not do that and i think that's going to be important to understand uh, just in terms of advocacy um and just in terms of of motivating change at the level of of politicians and bureaucrats um you know why are some states so much further ahead than some of the others and what do we do to get the laggards up front and i think those are going to be important questions to think about as well thank you thank you all three of you and uh, we would like to now i would like to sum up the issue so thank you ms bhavna anand for a very outstanding presentation and dr yamini atpavilas and dr anisha sharma for enriching discussion at the sub national level keeping the perspective of broad goals of equity inclusivity and sustainable development reassessment of discriminatory laws need to begin in the states and union territories to build the pathways for addressing discrimination and promoting better job opportunities for women the tras report has shown that while kerala tamil nadu goa provide greater freedom to women to choose work odisha uh, while uh, and odisha um, meghalaya chatisgarh west bengal impose more uh, most restrictions on uh, 
women's employment. And here, Dr. Anissa is saying about the political economy issues, I think become very important to examine. So we need to have an interdisciplinary team uh, of sociologists, anthropologists, ethnographers, economic historian, and the, uh, 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 the gender studies people to come together. The report has revealed complexities and co contradictions in characterizing employment relationships in developing economies uh, of the, at a subnational level and how various forms of discrimination have been perpetuated even by the labor laws. Here, one participant, Narayan, made a mention of labor codes. So these four labor codes, which have been uh, very meticulously uh, examined and uh, re critically reflected upon by the gender economists of our country, they have declared that they are patriarchal and gender discriminatory. Even in the language and the drafting of the rules, the general overview of the rules demonstrates that, that they are drafted in typical patriarchal setting, which considers that workers are all men and women constitute uh, wives and mothers of the workers. For example, the pronoun, quote unquote, he, or his is used universally in the labor codes, uh, the, the rules of the labor codes, and this should be changed to she uh, or he or a person. Well, I think that is the demand of the uh, feminists, uh, of the women's rights organization. This framing also in, excludes transgender community completely from the definition of worker, and there is no place in the wage sleep or in for, for form number five to write sex or the gender of a person. Among the representation of Central Advisory Board and other committees, there should be women's representation. That has also been the demand in the Labor Code. Otherwise, all the decision makers, uh, if there are men, then again, those biases would creep in. Uh, language of the new Labor Code is specifically stereotyping and uh, exclusionary of women. For example, most of the cattle work which is done by women, uh, but the workers are described in these categories such as calfmen, boatmen, uh, bell. Uh, so I think there also, uh, while the women are uh, described as a bell woman or a bitter woman, women, uh, they are also highly restrictive. And this category needs to be changed to persons and indication of any gender can do that work. No? So uh, there are 600 plus skills which are listed in the, in the rules of the labor code. There also we see that uh, there is a whole definition of semi-skilled, skilled or highly skilled workers, no? In that the uh, like highly skilled workers are those who have intensive technical and professional training and the practical occupational experience for the considerable period. Now, if do, do you take this kind of uh, rule uh, for implementation, women would always automatically, they will be excluded uh, from a high skill work and whatever work women do would always be classified as a uh, unskilled work. The standard family of uh, for a calculation of minimum wages in the labor code is considered to be of a, a spouse, child, two children, and uh, work himself or herself. Now, there is no mention of women-headed households in the labor code. In all the four labor codes, like women, 11, nearly 11% 11 of the households are managed where the main economic responsibility lies with the woman who is a widow or a separated or single or divorced, but uh, there is a no such mention in the labor codes. Unless structural and systemic discrimination is specifically addressed, there is a significant risk that future work trends will deepen existing inequalities for women and that's why approach to date of adding women into the masculine structure of work and economy has failed in realizing women's human rights and will continue to do so in a changing world of work guided by massive automation, artificial intelligence and robotics. Four labor codes to, uh, have to, facil uh, to facilitate the creation of world of work where women benefit and contribute on an equal basis with men requires reimagining the structure of work and economy as I think Dr. Anissa also brought in uh, the question of political economy or with women's human rights placed at the center. And I hope today's discussion will snowball into proactive public debate involving policymakers, legal luminaries, employers, and women's rights organization and gender economists to strive for equality in outcomes, not just support and resources for equity and justice in the world of work. So thank you very much. And I request Impri team to take over. Asa Patel. Yeah. If it's okay with you, may I just say? Yeah, please, please go ahead. Thanks. 
I, you know, oftentimes you write these things, you put them out in the world, you have no idea if somebody's reading them uh, and any of that. And that was how we reached out to you. I'm so grateful that you invited us. First, you read uh, and deeply appreciate it. Thank you for that. Coming from you, it means a lot to us uh, and to the Impre team for so quickly just putting this together and creating a movement. Uh, Anisha and Yamini, we've just started talking, but you guys have already just sort of, uh, uh, you know, sort of built this relationship. I am so grateful. Professor Gopinath Arjunji, thank you for also uh, your, uh, both your words of encouragement, but also coming in. Uh, joining this conversation. Thank you. You were brilliant. And congratulations to Trias team for really putting in such a hard work as it is, a, as I think, I mean, he said it's a backbreaking job. I think you, Anisha, you were saying, no, it's a big, yeah, it is very much. So to give, so to give the formal vote of thanks, Zubia, over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. As we come to the end of this extremely enlightening discussion, I, Subia Moin, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi, would like to formally propose a vote of thanks on behalf of the IMPRI Gender Impact Study Center. We'd like to express our gratitude to the speaker for today's session, Bhuvana Anand, for taking out her precious time to share her views on this crucial topic, the state of discrimination Subnational comparison of legal barriers to women's right to choose work in India. We thank our esteemed discussants, Dr. Yamini Arnavilas and Dr. Anisha Sharma, for adding their diverse perspectives and valuable insights to this deliberation. We are grateful to Professor Vibhuti Patel for chairing and leading the talk. And of course, we thank all our participants here on Zoom or on Facebook Live for participating and raising pertinent questions. We are grateful if you're watching us later on YouTube or listening to us on our various podcasts. I hope that you continue to tune in future to our gender gap and impre hashtag web policy talks. Thank you once again, and I wish you all a very good afternoon. Shanti ji from uh, Samata, feminist organization in Mysore. Uh, she has congratulated wonderful session. Priya Suman has also thanked for insightful discussion and yeah.